Yes. Thank you, Imran uh, and Emma, for your uh, nice words. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, Future Africa for hosting us. Um, this is indeed a new development in the life of uh, Tipsy. Um, we are moving into the second phase. And so I will give you a very top line overview. Uh, Imran talked about the SDGs. Uh, there is a question whether how, how helpful the SDGs are. So we have developed a specific interpretation of the SDGs, which is on this slide. So uh, because normally uh, what countries do, they do national reporting and they look at the individual SDGs and then they look at the targets and objectives and whether they meet them. Uh, our approach is that uh, if you look at the agenda 2030, at the core, and this is also, uh, you know, the, 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 in a way, the summary of what they want to achieve is transforming our world. So therefore, this is in the middle. Uh, so the SDGs are therefore transforming our world. And from this trans through this transformation lens, you can see that there are three types of SDGs. One type is about system, energy, healthcare, mobility. The other type is what we call is about directionality, reduction of poverty, uh, inequality, climate action. And then there are two SDGs about the framework conditions, about networks, the governance, peace, the type of conditions that need to be in place uh, to work on the SDGs. Um, so through this lens, then, what we say is that uh, in STI policy, we need to focus on system change into new directions. So these directions are, in fact, about very practical social and ecological uh, problems we face. And SDI policy is nowadays called upon to answer these problems. It's not enough just to say innovation will lead to economic growth. No, I think many of the parliaments across the world are, and are asked the question, how does science and innovation policy contribute to the social and ecological challenges. And that is at the core of our approach. So at the bottom here, you see this idea of three frames. Okay, it's it's not moving, my, my, my slides. Um, so uh, if you look at the history of STI policy, you will see that the, the first frame embedded in its history is the idea that we need R&D, we need knowledge production. So there have been uh, a lot of attempts to build up, of course, uh, our knowledge system. And this has been core to any uh, STI policy. Uh, in addition, uh, it became clear that it's not enough just to produce knowledge. You need to absorb knowledge. And you need to build links between universities, for example, and businesses and government. So it's about transfers of learning and co-production between all these actors. And entrepreneurship is also key because entrepreneurs need to use the knowledge and practice to create markets. But these efforts, as I said, were not focused on transformation. So what the third lens brings is a number of issues, but one thing they bring is this focus on system change. So STI, is not just about technology or technology fix. It's about changing systems. Uh, so why this is important, this uh, graph also tries to explain that because a lot of technological change and efforts are about system optimization. If you do that, for example, precision agriculture, you reduce the use of pesticide and herbicide, that's good, but you only get to a certain level. If you really want to address the deeper challenges, we need to move to system change. System optimization can be a bridge towards system change, but the role of the government, SDI policy, is to overcome transformational failure. They are the actor who should push for transformation. So what is at stake at system change? As I said, a system has several dimensions. Science and technology and infrastructures are one of them, but there's also a change needed of user preferences, of markets, a change of culture, a change of industry structure, 
and a change of policy. This is all implicated. And these changes need to be aligned uh, in systems. We, uh, you can see that there are actors who curate and maintain the system. So these are, you could say, the vested interest. And they are uh, using rules embedded in values for how they optimize the system. So in the end, system change is about change of values, mindsets, as much as it's about changing policies or changing technology. And it is about changing the actor networks because at the bottom here, you see niche actors. So in our understanding of system change is that an important source for system change are niche actors. So this is what we call our general theory of change. So there's a dominant practice in energy provision, in healthcare provision, in mobility provision, and there are alternative practices in niches. So there's a competition between these niches and the regimes. And regimes need to open up for change, while at the same time, these niches need to be developed and scaled up. So the role of STI policy in this figure is to build and construct niches, help them to accelerate and in fact become a regime but also open up existing regimes for change. Um, we have developed indicators for these uh, transformative processes. For example, how do you construct niches? What type of network is necessary? What type of visioning process? What type of learning? Uh, similarly, also for the acceleration, we focus on institutionalization, circulation, uh, so we have a number of transformative outcomes, we call them, that can be used to build a theory of change. Uh, we have done that in an experiment in uh, South Africa, the Living Catchment Project. And this is an infographic of the theory of change. And Sama, who was very key to this effort, is in the room. Uh, so what you see uh, at the top, you see these transformative outcomes. And through a process of many interactions, we translated them in outcomes that speak to the people involved in the process. Uh, so we create a more specific theory of change, also without the jargon, a lot of the jargon. I think the jargon in the process has, like niche and regime, has been very helpful. But in the end, when we communi communicate with the actors, uh, you can translate it in ordinary uh, language. So here at the bottom, you find the, the type of indicators that have been used in the uh, Living Catchment Project. For example, deepen the capacity for an understanding of policy advice, mainstreaming at the nexus point, the nexus between ecological uh, and uh, engineering uh, knowledge for how you engage with water management. Um, the experiments, in a way, are organized learning processes in order to get to, you know, new type of systems with all the actors. And it's important that the local actors are involved, alternative actors, civil societies, uh, they all need to be involved in this process. We also have been developing uh, a further framework called Deep Transition. Um, a lot of the uh, tipsy work has been about single systems, so changing the energy system, the water management system. But in the end, we need to change many systems and they are connected. So if you want to change the energy system without changing the mobility system, that's not possible, or without the food system. So the deep transition uh, analysis is, it provides a long-term perspective. So there is an the analysis that we went through five industrial revolutions, you may call them. And all, were, all these revolutions were nurtured and developed through systems, new systems. And we now live at a moment in time where we can choose to optimize the current industrialization path and modernization path or switch to a complete new development uh, pathway. You may call it sustainable development. So at stake in a way is the redirecting of the economy and, and the society. And this is a real big change process. Uh, but this is necessary to address climate change. We need an, another new type of economy. 
uh, the biodiversity loss, uh, the six uh, mass extinction, the inequality. Uh, so that is in a way the diagnosis that STI policy really needs to contribute to this deeper change process. So what does TIPSI do? So there's research, to, and this is research about how does change happen, but also the experiments are part of our research because we participate in these experiments as researchers. And the experience itself, we document as, and, and, and you know, we can publish, we will publish about them. Uh, we also have developed a research agenda. Then, there are the, then we have the experiments, they are really at the heart. But we also have a whole process of learning and capability building because the experiments are demonstrators and we share the results with a lot of other actors and we organize training and learning sessions because in the end, one experiment will not change the world. We build communities of practice. Of a whole, we mobilize, we want to mobilize a whole set of actors, uh, policymakers, as well as academics, as, as firms and civil society who engage with the process. And this has, uh, the first phase of TIPSI has ended. It has produced this uh, resource lab. And you can go online and, uh, and, and find it uh, with a whole set of tools. Uh, and we have nurtured a group of coaches, also some from South Africa, who know how to work with these tools. And they become part of a knowledge community. The last thing we worked on is working with the uh, private actors, because change will not only come about through uh, public investment. We also need to link it to private investors. So we have put together a panel where some of the public investors involved in TIPSI, Dan Dutrois from uh, South Africa was involved, worked with a number of private investors, institutional investors, so big pension funds, as well as impact investors. Uh, on this slide, you find Audrey Desiderado. Uh, she was uh, the executive director of Sunfunder, which is one of the, the biggest investors in solar in East uh, Africa. Um, and they, uh, this, they have uh, published, these investors have published a, a new framework for transformative investment, which is the complement to the transformative innovation policy. Well, this is the membership of uh, TIPSI. Uh, these are the core members and we have associate members. So associate members did an experiment or a case study with us. Uh, and there were in Africa, three of them, uh, Senegal, Kenya, and Ghana. Um, and they, uh, this was work funded by the IDSC. And we are now working towards hubs, uh, where we on a regional scale also try to uh, work with the governments. Uh, so in Latin America, uh, we have a hub in, and now in Africa, we had one, but this is, uh, we opening up now for a new, more uh, formal and institutional space here at Future Africa. And we had one, we are developing one in Europe. So what is the, uh, the, the what are the principles of the, uh, the membership? Well, uh, they aim for system change and they aim for nurturing and developing these transformative niches and they engage in experimentation, policy experimentation. And they understand that these uh, experiments are learning processes. Uh, so they are also organized as learning processes with a lot of reflection and uh, ID generation and co-creation by the actors themselves. It's not like the researchers produce of, you know, the solutions and then hand them over to the practitioners. No, it's a co-creation process where the practitioners, in fact, of course, are the main actors and they use the inputs we provide uh, and appropriate and own them for developing their own activities and theories of change, as we showed for the living catchment. And we call this a process of formative evaluation. So because a lot of time government has a kind of what you may call old evaluation afterwards, was the project successful? And then people often look at output, you know, how many uh, publications, how many people were involved, so all of these deliverables, as they call, we focus on outcomes. So this is change, changing people's view, ideas, 
networks. Uh, so it's far more focused on, uh, on, on learning. And we do this in the process, not afterwards, but in the process, we in a way attach a formative evaluation process and we participate as evaluators in the process. In fact, we become, become participants. So this is the method we have been developing. Um, so this is the operational model of uh, Tipsy. Uh, well, first of all, there's money involved and I will come to that, but most importantly, there's people involved. So if you start to work with Tipsy or with the hub, it's also about time of people. Uh, and this is in fact far more important in a way than the, the money. So there need to be a decision about uh, allocation of time of people uh, who work in the experiments. Uh, we also do that now with the private actors. Uh, they find this difficult because they want to see us in the first place sometimes as consultants. But we say we are not consultants. We are not, you know, we don't give you a report with the solution. We, you are, we are participating in your process. While you are participating in our research process, in fact. Uh, so the idea is that the members will do an experiment as an organized learning process, capability building uh, process. And these experiments create spaces for these interactions between, uh, between actors. So what are the benefits, basically, of joining the consortium? Um, well, it's a help. So if you want your STI policy to address the SDGs, the social and ecological challenges, uh, this will help you to do that through uh, this notion of enabling transformation. You will get access to research, resources, research, training, and experiments in other areas of the world, in other countries, because we have a platform where we share all these exper experiences. Uh, you will become part of a network of front runners because Tipsy, as Imran was alluding to, in a way is, is a niche in STI policy. And the next phase of Tipsy is about extending the niche and doing more experiments, connect to the private actors, having more countries involved, and uh, through that, we also strengthening the research capacity because it's not us from Sussex and Utrecht who will do most of the research. It's local researchers who work with local policymakers. Uh, and we are also involved. Uh, but basically, we want to build up research, resource capacity, research capacity in each country. And then there's the access to the private actors through the deep transition lab. And, uh, and there's an, uh, you need to engage with this larger community and receive uh, also feedback. So we have two types of membership. One type is becoming a founding or core member for the next phase of Tipsy. There's a, there's a fee of 60,000 pound annually. Uh, but what you get back for this is that you become, uh, you get a seat on the governing board and you can help to direct the work program because the, the membership fee is owned by the members. They put a work program together uh, based with this money. So we pool the money, develop a working program, and on the global level, it's about connecting all the local and regional experiences. And it's about building this kind of global and regional infrastructure and if you become a core or founding member, you will be in a drive, sitting in a driving seat, uh, developing uh, the work program. Associate members, uh, they also pay a fee, but a much lower fee, but they uh, do experiments. So the basic reason to become an associate member is if you want to do an experiment, the experiments itself will be separately contracted uh, how much money that costs really depends also on local circumstances. So if you involve local researchers, you know, this different, how this process works is really different per country. Uh, so these are the, uh, this is how the membership works. Um, so I hope, uh, that we can see a lot of extension of the membership in the coming phase. 
we plan to start the next phase in August, September. 